Hello, my name is Socrates, and I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Cambridge researching the blast resilience of blaze facades. Renewed focus on the threat to buildings by terrorist attacks has intensified the demand for blast resilient buildings. This requires facades to act as the first barrier of defense to protect occupants. However, these are primarily architectural elements and are often inherently brittle, as is the case with glazed facades. Multiple glazing failures were observed in the recent disaster in Beirut, with many damages occurring kilometers away from the explosion source. Consequently, the blast waves penetrated the building interior, resulting in financial damages and harming occupants. Additionally, a large percentage of injuries were glass-related, as is the case with most blast events. Laminated glass panels are therefore increasingly installed in facades to enhance the blast re re resilience of buildings. These are composite panels that include most commonly polyvinyl butyral interlayers, also referred to as PVB. These panels offer residual resistance following the fracture of the glass layers and reduce glass-related injuries as PVB can retain glass fragments. The blast response of these panels, however, is complex and often requires assistance from blast testing to validate designs. Most of the existing analysis methods assume a pure membrane response of the PVB in the post-fracture stage. This, however, is in contradiction with a failure pattern repeatedly observed in blast tests that resembles a yield line pattern. As yield lines can form in cracked reinforced concrete, which is also a brittle material reinforced by ductile material to carry tension, my research aims to investigate if there's any residual bending moment resistance for laminate glass panels following the fracture of the glass layers. Additionally, I also aim to assess if the effects of inertia experienced by laminated glass panels during a blast event are responsible for the different pattern observed compared to the yield lines formed under static loading. Starting with a post-fracture bending on resistance of laminated glass, previous experimental work on pre-fracture specimens has demonstrated that this is negligible. However, these tests were performed at low strain rates as opposed to the high strain rates anticipated under blast loading. This is important as PVB is a thermoplastic polymer that becomes significantly stiffer at high strain rates. The response under blast loading is therefore fundamentally different compared to the previous experimental work at low strain rates. PVB is also sensitive to temperature and using previous experimental work, I demonstrated that there's a time temperature dependency similar to many other polymers. Therefore, the PVB response at high strain rates can be simulated with low temperatures by deriving a time temperature mapping equation. This uncouples the inertia effects and allows the investigation of the pseudostatic bending moment capacity. Quasi-static bending tests were performed at minus 100 degrees Celsius and were compared to room temperature tests to assess the influence of high strain rates. Using the mapping equation derived, a maximum PVB strain rate of 25 per second was calculated at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, which is a typical value expected under blast loads. The tests were performed on various prefactured patterns, with the images here showing the simplest pattern considered that includes a single crack scored at midspan. A comparison of the low displacement response recorded from the low and room temperature tests indicates a significantly stiffer response at low temperatures. This becomes more evident by replotting the room temperature results at a different scale. The results of the low temperature test demonstrate an enhancement of the ultimate load capacity of the fractured glass by two orders of magnitude compared to that at room temperature. This suggests an improved post-fracture bending moment capacity at low temperatures associated with a now stiffer interlayer working intention in the glass fragments working compression. Due to the time temperature dependency of the PVB, a similar enhancement is therefore anticipated at the high strain rates associated with typical blast loading. Based on experimental results from the low temperature bending test, analytical models were developed to describe the post-fracture bending moment capacity of laminate glass. 
Following the initial flexible response until the glass fragments in the lock, a linear response is observed and the fractured panel bends elastically in a composite manner. At this stage, the PVB is in the initial slope of the stress strain diagram and although it resembles an elastic material, it remains viscoelastic. The bending moment capacity was derived for this stage under the assumptions of plane sections remaining plane and by applying the transformed section approach commonly used in analysis of reinforced concrete. The compression component is provided by the glass fragments that come into contact as the panel deforms and the tension component is provided by the interlayer. A non-linear response is observed in the next stage due to the change in slope in the PVD material model. Although the transition point is often referred to as yield stress, it only refers to the stress to which a significant change in modulus is observed, rather than the onset of true plasticity. A plastic hinge eventually forms when the top glass layer crushes in compression, resulting into a collapse mechanism for the simply supported specimens tested. The moment capacity for this stage is derived by taking moment equilibrium about the plastic neutral axis. In the final stage, the PVB tears when the failure strain is reached. The response, however, is a tensive anticipated to be more ductile under blast events, as the low temperature results in a stiffer adhesion bone that inhibits the lamination of the glass fragments and causes brittle failure of the PVB. The analytical models developed also account for the effects of in-plane restraints offered by the blast-resistant frames. These introduce membrane forces at large deflections due to the panel stretching, resulting in a combined bending and membrane action. A yield condition was therefore derived for the post-fracture stage to determine the relative contribution of bending moments and membrane forces. Now, moving on to the effects of inertia, simplified dynamic rigid plastic analytical models were considered to try to interpret the repeated failure pattern observed from blast tests. Considering a simply supported beam under the impact of a uniform short duration rectangular pulse with moderate pressures, it is well known that a single plastic hinge will form at mid-span, as is also the case for statically loaded structures when the pseudostatic capacity is reached. Under short duration pulses, however, ductile structures are expected to be able to resist loads significantly higher than the pseudostatic capacity due to the additional effects of inertia. To continue satisfying the material law under intense loading, this will result in two plastic hinges forming initially that will start traveling towards the mid-span location once the applied pulse has decayed. Eventually, the traveling hinges will transition to a final pattern that is identical to the stationary collapse mechanism under static or moderate dynamic loading. The same principles can also be expended, ex uh, extended to two-way spanning plates, such as laminated glass panels. Again, the collapse mechanism under static loading or moderate dynamic loading is different compared to the propagating yield lines observed under intense loading. Inertia effects are therefore considered to be responsible for the failure pattern of laminated glass panels repeatedly observed in blast tests. To validate this theory of a yield line mechanism forming from traveling hinges and laminate glass panels, specimens will be impacted with polymer, projecti polymer projectiles launched from a gas gun, which simulate the loading from a blast pulse. Such experimental tests have been used previously to investigate traveling hinge phenomena during the blast response of sandwich panels. The experimental work, however, is still ongoing due to COVID-19 delays. It is hoped that the developed analytical models and the improved understanding of the blast response of laminated glass panels will reduce the need for expensive blast testing. Additionally, it is expected that by including this fractured bending moment capacity in assessment, it will enable the optimization of panel designs. Therefore, by utilizing the entire material capacity, waste will be reduced, resources will be conserved, and thinner panels will be achieved that are favorable by architects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Socrates. Um, 
Perfect timing. Um, I was just going off and got to the final slide. Uh, thank you. Very, very interesting um, presentation. I thought very, you know, very, very clearly communicating the, the great work that, that you're doing. Um, I, I have a have a question before I then sort of open it up to uh, some of my fellow fellow judges. Um, I was just wondering if you could just expand a little bit on what you thought the the benefits to sort of wider users society would be. You know, the building users or building owners or um, you know, other than society, is it going to mean we can, you know, all have blast resistant glass? Is it going to mean that it brings the price down? Is it going to mean that it can work more reliably? Can you can you just expand on that a little bit? I think uh, it, it is well known that laminated glass panels provide superior blast resistance compared to monolithic panels. Obviously, this is a more expensive choice for a, a client to ask, and uh, therefore this is usually recommended only for buildings that are at risk from terrorist attacks. However, even for buildings that are terrorist attacks, understanding how laminate glass panels work and not requiring to do tests in advance to validate designs will mean that we are gonna start designing these panels as we design all the other traditional structural materials using analysis tools. However, also expanding our knowledge into how laminate glass panels work in the post-fracture stage will unlock their potential and possibly be able to use these panels into harsher environments, not just for blast, but in cold temperatures, under fire, or seismic events. Very interesting, thank you. Uh, now I'll go to Eleni, who has a question. If you can unmute yourself, Eleni. Um, so my question is uh, regarding the maximum temperature you're using. Uh, it's 25. So. Uh, I think I would expect in practical situations uh, the temperature of a, of a facade system to be higher. Um, c could you explain this further or uh, comment on this? So this is the room temperature. So for instance, this is the uh, a typical temperature you would expect on the outside side of the panel. Um, and for instance, typical blast tests that are performed are performed under room temperature. So I performed my simulations to compare my results compared to blast tests that are performed um, under room temperature. That's why I use the 25 degrees um, temperature to map my, my, my calculations from the minus 100 to the 25 degrees. I see. Um, but uh, in theory, would you expect uh, a difference if you had um, 40 Celsius or uh, due to for the... Instance, uh, for, for warmer climates, if you had laminate glass panels, for instance, in, in uh, in warmer climates, such as in Dubai or uh, yeah, or in, anywhere else with 40 degrees, the um, the performance of laminate glass panels deteriorates. So the higher the temperature, the weaker the interior becomes. So obviously, um, the higher the temperature, the weaker the panels are. But this is all extrapolated. As I, as I found out, what is the capacity of 25 degrees? This very simply can be done to say, okay, let's extrapolate the minus 100 degrees temperature to what the capacity would be at 40 degrees, for instance. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, great. So I'll go to Dennis quickly. I think we've got just a minute left before we go to the next presenter. Could you ask your question, Dennis, if you unmute yourself? Yep. Um, Socrates, I just want to ask, you mentioned about the um, U-line pattern similar to, you know, the laminated glass. So from my understanding, U-line pattern very much dependent on support conditions. Um, if you have a, a very sort of thin and large glass, will that still work with the U-line pattern method you, you know, assume or simulate? Uh, very, very good question. And unfortunately, you're very right. I forgot to mention what the boundary conditions are. So in general, for blast protection, it is recommended that the laminate glass panels are supported all around. So these yield light patterns are for simply supported uh, supports all around the panel, so for two-way spanning action. Obviously, if you had fixed supports, you would also develop a hogging yield line all around the supports. Now, if you have point supports, uh, it's not very easy at this point to answer if you will still be able to develop a collapse mechanism as you would have under static loads. Um, I must say that you, we probably need to do further research. However, at this stage, I think the, rec the recommended guidelines is to avoid using point support for blast protection. However, there's further research going on to understand what is the response under point loads, as these are often preferred by, by architects. It's, it's not about the uh, support, 
is more to do with the uh, aspect ratio. What sort of aspect ratio is the limit? So the width to the length of the panel. Yes. So 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 if if the panel, for instance, has an aspect ratio of one and it's a square, then you would have a different uh, yield line pattern compared if it's a, a rectangular panel. Yes. Okay. Thank you.